Thanks everyone for listening to the Racer Racer podcast. We just wanted to say a few things before we get into our official intro um, that we're doing with Jagger Jones, which you'll get to here in a minute. I um, just wanted to thank everyone for watching and listening. If you haven't already, please make sure you hit like and subscribe. Um, do exactly as Scott's telling you to do with nodding his head. <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, um, definitely appreciate everyone listening and watching. Um, if you're listening or watching now, you already know who our guest is. Our guest is Mario Andretti. Um, yeah, I don't think it gets much, um, bigger than that. What do you think, Scott? No, I don't either. I, I, um, man, he was so generous and kind to take time out and speak with us and, you know, gave us roughly an hour of his time. And, you know, man, you know, it's like anything else we could have talked for hours. You know, there's an endless stream of questions, you know. Yeah, um, as we were saying earlier, when we started this podcast, I made a list of of names of people that I wanted to get. And most of those people, I was like, yeah, we'll never get these people. And, you know, obviously Mario was um, on the top of that list or right up there near the top. And I never thought we'd, you know, be able to get him, especially this soon. So we're definitely very thankful for that. I um, definitely want to thank um, his publicist, um, Patty Reed, who was really great and, um, you know, definitely – helped us get this scheduled definitely could have done it without her obviously um and you know we had to work out some time constraints stuff like that and um yeah she was great so really do appreciate it and you know really meant a lot to have have him on the show yeah i couldn't i couldn't um i can't agree more with that and thank you for all the your due diligence and, and making sure we could get a time together and make something happen with him uh you know because these guys are they're, I mean, they're, they're rare, right? I mean, yeah. the the best of the very best of his sport, you know, in that top 1% um, for any sport mm -hmm. is hard to come by. And um, I mean, it'd again, be like man, us trying to get yeah. an interview with, you know, Michael Jordan or something. It's not going to happen. Right. Yeah. I mean, that that's a great analogy. I mean, you know, um, yeah, I yeah, I don't think you can put it any better than that. But yeah, but so before the Mario um interview, we we have um well Jagger Jones has who's a good friend of the show. As we were saying the last um episode, me and Scott were both fortunate enough to be at the track. Um I guess that was last weekend, right? Not not this past weekend, but the weekend before, so two weeks two right. weekends ago. Um to be at the track when he was testing for Cape Motorsports and the USF two thousand, um road to Indy series. So he has an announcement, so we'll let him get into it if you haven't seen it already. Um, and, yeah, we definitely, you know, really appreciate everyone listening. And like I said, make sure you hit like and subscribe. And, yeah, no, we definitely appreciate the support. And definitely stay tuned for the coming weeks because we have some other um, really good ones coming out. Um, we just recorded um, another Legend of the Sport last week, and we actually talked about that um, a little bit last week. But... Um, yeah, it, it's going to be a great, great one as well. And this is also one that's definitely one of the all-time greats. Yeah, yeah, he, he really is. And it was so fun to talk to him. And I can't wait to release that one. And, yeah, Jagger, um, you know, I, it, when we talked to him the first time, you know, his career was kind of up in the air a little bit as mm -hmm. far as what he was going to be able to do. And uh, the doors in NASCAR, I, I wouldn't say are shut, but they – it's a pretty uh, pretty expensive key to get in, <laughs> let's just say. And uh, he was able to put together a deal for USF 2000. And he's out of the box and testing. He's had a great start. And uh, we wish him nothing but the best. And, again, like Aaron said, thank you for coming on the show. And we're going to try to have him come back uh, during the season, kind of do some updates. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I don't know much more you can say about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and get into the intro. And thanks, everyone, for listening. You're listening to the Racer to Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs. I'm your co-host, Aaron Macti, our other co-host. You may have seen walking out of a great club with a big old smile on his face. You may have seen him at a dirt track. He is the one and only Scott Bowie. Hello, Aaron. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? 
Good. Hey, for anybody watching, you will notice that we have a third face on the screen, and we are very lucky to have back today Jagger Jones. Jagger, how are you doing today, bud? I'm feeling honored. First, I'm honored to be the first guest of the Racer to Racer podcast and be back today talking with you guys. Well, you should feel honored. <laughs> <laughs> No, we appreciate you coming in. Uh, hey, before we get to what you're doing, we always talk a little bit about the racing roundup and uh, over the weekend and not much going on except for Kyle Larson wins the cup championship. And did you have a chance to watch any of that? I did. I watched uh, the majority of the race. I thought it was a pretty good race. I think um, it was deserving for him to win, even though it came down to like that last caution. But I was happy to see him win. it. I think uh, especially in this format they have now, it's like, kind of if he going into the last race if the person that deserves the championship is going to win it and it was good to see him be able to pull that off with the year he had now you uh you ran a championship race at uh phoenix as well a few years ago in the arca series you weren't battling for the championship but you did clinch second place in the championship what's it like running phoenix uh especially around that time of day is it slippery is it um it's the sun going into turn one in the evening, um, like it, they were talking about a lot on the TV at the end of the race. It's really bad. You go into, or I guess it's turn three now. I'm still stuck on the old Phoenix. But um, going into uh, turn three, you're literally blinded. Like you can't see anything. And it's already kind of a tricky, narrow entry. So that makes it pretty tough. Um, it doesn't get too hot and slick, um, but one and two could get a little slick because uh, when the sun's going down, um, it's sun sh uh, shining right on the track in one and two. But the biggest thing was probably the sun that they were fighting. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think back. It was a couple years ago now and only raced there once. So. That, uh, you know, you see everybody cut the dog leg and have to drop off and get back on. How, how rough is that transition off and on? Um, it's definitely not smooth, but you're, it doesn't feel, it doesn't really upset the car. Like you feel, you definitely feel like the bump of it, but it does, you're kind of going in a straight line usually when you, uh, cut across it. So it's not too upsetting to the car, but you can definitely feel like the, like the G out of the bump. Um, but it's just like kind of what you have to do. Um, especially on restarts were crazy because they, it was before they were really enforcing, um, you being able to cross before the, the line, which they're starting to do now, which I don't know if that's necessarily a good or bad thing, but it's the same for everyone. So um, I think that's made it a little bit less chaotic because when we were doing it, we were going right when they would like even get close to throwing the green. We'd go all the way down the wall. Um, so it made it super hectic, but now they've kind of mellowed it out a little bit. But I think it's cool that they've added that, made Phoenix a little different than any other track. Yeah, it's it certainly is different. You know, you mentioned the old Phoenix. Now, being an old man, I prefer the old Phoenix. But uh, I imagine as a driver, it's something a little different, and you, you know, it's something you don't run across very often. So it's probably pretty exciting to mm -hmm. run there. Yeah, it is. Um, turns one and two are super cool, long, fast. It's cool that they're starting to make it where you can open it up and run two grooves. Or actually, really any part of the racetrack below the apron all the way up to the wall. Like Hamlin was making some time up there at the end. Um, one and two is definitely really tricky. Just trying to get the drive off of, or not one and two, three and four. Sorry, I'm so confused on the corner numbers still, but um, three and four can be a little tricky just because they're so different, but it's a cool track. And um, I wish we would have got to race there more. They, the Arca series and, and truck and them are going like twice a year, but when we did it, we only went there once for the final race. Um, so maybe, maybe one day again, we'll see. I don't, I don't know if IndyCar, We'll be going back there too soon, but yeah, I don't see them going back anytime soon. That uh, you um, you had a good tweet today, uh, just talking about how hard it is to win a championship and talking about the teams and man, how about that last pit stop? Yeah, man. it's it was crazy how um, they they deserved that the crew I think and they lived up to the pressure and. Um, they really made the difference for Larson to be able to go and go on and win the championship. And yeah, my tree was talking about how many different factors and how much auto, just all auto sports in general is a team sport. Like often we only think about the driver, but a lot of times, especially in this day and age, being in a good, being in good equipment is just as, or if not 
even more important as being um, a good driver. And that all comes down to teams. There's so many people uh, from engineers to crew chiefs uh, to your tire guys, to your pit crew. There's so many people that make this such a team sport. And I think even me and a lot of other people often forget that. Like it's just as much as team sport and they just don't get the credit um, sometimes, but it was cool to, for them to be able to get the credit. I know they were talking about it a lot because they put themselves in the position and, and made up for um, those last couple spots on the final pit stop. So that was really cool to see and them get the recognitions that they deserve. Yeah, I agree. You know, uh, they said it was the second fastest stop they had all year. I mean, what better time to have it? Well, you know, it's a great thing for Kyle Larson. Uh, a lot of people are happy. A lot of us dirt track people pretty excited to see it. But that's not why we're here today to talk to you. Jagger, you have some news that you dropped last week. Uh, kind of share that with everybody. Yes, I do. And I'm really excited about it. I'll be racing with Kate Motorsports next year in the USF 2000 series. A uh, bit of switch up from you guys that have followed me. I've been kind of focused on the NASCAR stuff uh, the last four years or so and um, going to the Road to Indy series and the USF 2000 series next year is a little bit of a switch up, a little bit of a career change, you could say, a career path direction, um, kind of going a different way now. And um, there's kind of a few factors that's added to that. Um, one just being how good the Road to Indy series is doing right now and I think how good IndyCar racing is. Um, I grew up racing go-karts on road courses um, with a lot of people that are in IndyCar now um, or almost in IndyCar and some people that are over doing well in F1. So, um, and I competed against those kids growing up, um, having coming from a road course background, racing in Europe on road courses. Um, it's not something that is too unfamiliar, but I've definitely focused more on the oval side of things and the stock car stuff the last couple of years. But going back a little a little bit now, and um, I'm excited to be um, running some open the whole open wheel USF 2000 series next year. And we began testing. I've had a couple of days in the car uh, most recently at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before at the Chris Griffiths Memorial Test. And we ended both days first there, um, which was exciting and productive for me to um, start feeling some things and getting on some new tracks. Uh, in a formula style car and what I'll be racing next year. So I'm super excited and I'm, I'm really happy with how I've worked with Dominic and Nicholas Cape at Cape Motorsports. They're really smart guys. And um, I think we're going to have a really good near good year next year. We just got to, just got to get more comfortable in the car um, this winter, getting some more seat time and laps and uh, we'll be ready for next year. What would you say? The- oh, go ahead, Aaron, please do. I was going to say, what what was the big, what's the biggest difference going from driving a NASCAR style car to driving an open wheel car like that? Um, the first thing that kind of took me a little bit, a little bit of time to get used to, and um, it's just something I'm not accustomed to with anything I've ever driven, is the braking in the Formula style of cars. Um, the brake pedal and just the pressure you have to apply you have to apply so much pre- uh, pressure and the pedal's so stiff and braking is the first thing you do when you get when you're trying to take a corner um so kind of the how you break affects the whole corner so if you don't break properly um you're gonna have too much speed into the corner or you're gonna have to break too early or you're gonna have to trail break going in so that's kind of gonna mess up your whole corner so that was kind of making me not struggle but that's what I was um thought was my biggest weakness uh the first couple times I drove the car just getting that down because that's the most important thing it's the first thing that happens so if you mess up the braking the whole rest of the corner isn't going to be there's no chance for it to be proper um so that's been a big struggle because in the NASCAR stuff and stock car stuff you kind of want to roll off the throttle and roll into the brakes pretty mellowly um, just because they're such heavy cars, um, they don't. You can't make that tr- transition so quick on the pedals, um, like you can in a nimble, light Formula car. Um, so that was one thing, and just how hard you're able to drive the Formula cars compared to a big, heavy tacky, taxi cab um, style stock car, where okay. the there's a lot of rollover weight, and you just got to be so mellow with everything in the stock car, and you don't want to spin the tires or um, 
overheat the tires really at all um in a stock car and you have to be super mellow you got to drive with like an eggshell under your foot as um some people would say and um in the formula stuff you kind of got to push it a little bit harder and really use the grip and the downforce that's there and i i don't it hasn't been too rough of a transition period it's just me knowing like okay i can drive harder um and it's like i feel like it's an easier thing than having to learn to drive easier and more mellow um so now i just got to combine like being smooth kind of find the balance of being smooth while also maximizing the grip the car has i think we definitely saw you pushing hard um when you were running in the rain on saturday through that mm-hmm. one turn scott i forget what's turn mm-hmm. that would even be uh, that's the one in the i think first, it would be first turn of the oval yeah so it would be a 13 i don't know the numbers degree. by the by the museum yeah. yeah it's the corner um coming off of uh turn one of the oval the 90 right um yeah so that's where i think you guys were standing and yeah i got some laps in the rain too which was really cool um to just kind of get experience with that because you never know when it's going to rain right before a race next year and to have some laps in the wet um was good experience to find that too because i haven't driven in the rain since i was 13 14 years old which was in go-karts so that was about five years ago because obviously the nascar um and oval stuff we don't race when it rains so um that was a little bit of a um something that i wasn't super used to in a big car but i seem to feel like i adapted pretty well and um it's good to have that under my belt going into next year did the um you know and of course as we talked to you the first time uh you know, you're going to college, Dean's List, going to throw that in there. Got to always uh, give a shout out to anybody doing good in school. Yeah. Um, but you're going to college and uh, you've been working and working and working. You you specifically went to school in North Carolina to try to get a NASCAR deal uh, while you were in school. And things just couldn't hammer out for whatever reason. And, um, and then you get a opportunity to go do this. Did the Halo, the in- incoming Halo, have any, have any bearing on that? Uh, change that for you? No, I, I didn't. When I started looking at running some of the stuff, I didn't even know that they were adding to the, the Halo for okay. next year, for 2022. Um, I think it's great that they're making the cars safer. Um, I, I wasn't too necessarily ever worried about, obviously your safety is a concern for everyone and everything. But for me as a driver, I try not to think about that too much. Um, I think that's more might have been a concern or a plus for my mom. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, right, see me sure. driving with a halo and especially Indy car who, who races on the really fast ovals, having the arrow screen now and uh, just making the series a lot, a lot safer. Um, I don't I don't think that was a huge deciding factor, but it's definitely a plus. Um, just our whole sport getting safer um, is great. But um, I don't really think that was, I didn't really think about that too much. That's, I never really thought about that until, um, you just brought that up. <laughs> the, uh, I, yeah, I wasn't sure, you know, I mean, uh, it's always something that you got away and, and, uh, we had never really ever talked about it. So I, I wasn't, I wasn't too sure if that helped make that decision a little easier for you or not. And, um, kind of, as we talked about, you are, going with Cape who has a lot of success in this sport and um, especially those junior ranks. And uh, you were kind enough to have Aaron and I out uh, to be around the garage area uh, when you guys were testing the other day. And boy, you you mentioned hard work in the earlier uh, segment, talking about Larson's team in your tweet earlier today, man, those guys work hard. That is a hard working team because yeah. there's three cars. They, were, they had three cars at the test, mm-hmm. you know, and that, I mean, those guys really, really put the work in. Yeah. I've had, I've been lucky uh, to have spent a few days with them at the shop on the simulator and just been around a little bit uh, these past couple months. And yet, like you said, they care about one thing and that's winning and whatever it yeah. takes um, from what I've seen so far, um, whatever it takes, they're willing to do. And, um, a lot of hours they've put into this and I think it just, um, that's explained by their results. If you look, they've won so many, (laughs) 
excuse me, um, they've won so many uh, championships and you don't, that's, you don't do that by luck. You do that by hard work, consistency, uh, putting your team in the right spots, having good drivers. They do everything it takes to win. And that's really what I saw on them. And that's uh, kind of a big deciding factor of why I chose, um, why I thought they were the best fit for me going into next year. Yeah, I, Aaron and I walked around a little bit and we're looking at other teams. And man, there's some really nice teams and really, you know, I mean, really great teams and nothing against any of them. But I was watching your garage. Of course, you know, that's where we're at most of the time. And you can just see, you can almost feel it. I mean, it's they're, they, they've they got something there that just, um, it's kind of almost an intangible, but you can kind of feel the expectations and the quality and what they do. Yeah, for sure. I, like you said, they're, um, they definitely have a good, sh- um, like show and definitely nice looking cars and good hospitality, but that you can tell it's not their focus. Their focus is on winning, making the cars the best they can, looking over data, um, trying to coach the drivers as much as they can, trying to figure out what we can do to be better, um, uh, one day after and next. And, um, I, I really felt that with them when I drove with them the first time and um, I saw a championship caliber team and the results proved that as well. And I, and I saw that. So that was really what um, made that decision for me. Yeah, I, I, um, I just, I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing to go test, you know, because uh, you had done a little bit of open testing you know, at Road America and, and Audubon. And it's another thing to come to the Speedway and turn laps. And, and you got all the teams there. And you got a lot of people there, too. I mean, you got some presser, not a lot, but some presser and that. And it's another thing to kind of go out there and to be able to perform with the eyes on you. And, uh, man, you, you really had a great two days. Um, you know, was there – I mean, even like in the first time – getting in the car, say, when you first test with them, was, was it kind of like just, I wouldn't say falling back in old habits because you never really drove those cars, but was it fairly easy for you just to kind of pick it up? Yeah, I think one thing, like, for me as a driver, I think one place I really shine is just pretty, I'm a pretty adapted <laughs> driver. Um, I've driven, like, I haven't raced a ton of different things, but I've definitely driven a fair share of cars from go-karts to um, legend cars to off-road stuff to having uh, some laps and a couple races and some midgets and um, some not too much sports car, but some road road course type cars a little bit um, here and there. And I just think driving that a lot of different things like that have helped me and um, allowed me to be really like adaptive. And I also think I'm like, I don't rely really much on like natural talent and natural feel. I'm pretty, um, I look at like all the data and um, the whole, I I really think about like what I'm doing when I go out there and drive before I drive. Um, I drive my simulator a lot and I really try to um, make it the most like what what the car is going to be like when I go out there. Um, So I think all of those factors kind of, allow me to be pretty adaptive when I get in a new style car or go to a new track. And Mm -hmm. I, so I wasn't too worried about getting used to the USF car um, or an open wheel style car in general. Um, And I, I think just all those factors, like I was saying, kind of play into that. And I knew there wasn't a ton of pressure of having to get up to speed right, right away um, because we have a good amount of testing that we're going to be doing before um, the first race in St. Pete in February. So um, a good amount of days in the car, the pressure wasn't too high at the beginning. Um, so there wasn't too much stress, but even right away we were, I was pretty fast. Um, I think it's just fine tuning things and f- figuring out like how to set up an open wheel style car and working my feedback um, just because the feel is so different than I'm used to. That's going to be, I think the, a little bit more of a, a challenge but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. We were talking a little bit about the, the simulator. So talk a little bit about how close the simulator actually is to actually driving. Like what aspects of the simulator do you think are 
I guess, pretty close and what maybe is kind of lacking with it? Um, I think the simulators are um, like really realistic for a lot of things. I think learning new tracks is the biggest of right. what a simulator can do. Um, just knowing basically when I hit in Indianapolis Motor Speedway or Road America for the first time, it felt like my 500 lap there, not my first lap there. Even the very first lap I did on the track, just because it's literally GPS laser scanned. Every bump, every inch of it is to the correct dimensions. So you feel like you're really already have driven this track. Um, obviously, it's you kind of got to still work up to it a little bit just to be cautious. But without a simulator, like I've gone to driven a new track without a simulator. I'm trying to think like when not not very often, but um, it's kind of like you got to take a whole session just learning the track. And with simulators, you don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. And I think that's going to be really helpful for me next year. Not have been able, I haven't been to any of the tracks besides now Road America and in Indianapolis. So we go to six different tracks that I have yet at this point haven't driven on. So I think that's going to be a huge tool and a huge help. Um, for me as less experienced on those tracks um, for what other things that are pretty realistic um, even like the braking like I was talking about earlier that I've kind of struggled with uh, a little bit and I'm starting to get the hang of better um, even a simulator is helpful for that I completely like redid the brake pedal on my simulator and uh, to like make it more stiff and make it just how it feels in the um, open wheel car and I'm just practicing on like brake traces and um, footwork technique that I know I need to, to have completely down um, and try to just get that into muscle memory because um, it's the same motion. I'm sitting in the same position as in a real race car. And um, so it really compares a lot like that. Um, I think it's crazy too, because like you're looking at data uh, on your driving just as much on the simulator as you are in, in real life. Um, so there's no getting away with anything and uh, we try to make it <laughs> like as realistic as possible the downsides of a simulator I think I don't think you can rely on it too much though like once you get to the track and um, then you got to focus on that I know like a lot of people try to use the simulator to like like mimic like, like setup changes and stuff which I, I don't know I haven't been too involved in that but I can see where um that could be a little bit of an issue and kind of lead you in the wrong direction. Um, I think if you've already been dri driving the car for a long time and um, know the tracks you're going to, um, a simulator might not be as helpful and kind of could mess you up a little bit. But when you're starting from zero, especially like I was in open wheel cars and um, kind of am going to some of these tracks, I think it's a huge tool. And it's kind of... <clears throat> kind of ironic obviously one of your role models you've looked up to is jimmy johnson and he's actually going through now um something kind of similar to what you're going through going from driving a nascar style car i mean obviously he drove nascars much longer than you mm -hmm. you did but um it's kind of like the you know same um same aspect um is that something you think that you'll kind of maybe get some advice from jimmy on on kind of a yeah thing? definitely i um I need to talk to Jimmy. I, I talked to him a little bit before I was going to do all this and um, I need to um, try to set up a time to talk to him and stuff. And um, yeah, it's funny how it's kind of, I was joking. I'm kind of stalking him, falling him, <laughs> right, right. Uh, around as you could say, but no, it's good. And, and Jimmy's a great guy and it's um, was good to see him start improving a little bit at the end of last season, um, starting to click. And I think, I think he's such a talented driver and, um, I think he'll start um, improving from where he was last year, this year. And um, maybe I heard there's some talks. He might race some ovals, which will be cool to see um, how he does on those. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's funny. I'm following him. Well, there's worse people to follow. I mean. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, right. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, you were talking about uh, versatility and, as we kind of wind this down a little bit, uh, this show, this interview is going to actually tag into the front of our Mario Andretti episode, who obviously is everybody knows is one of the most versatile race car drivers in history. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you grew up obviously in a family with extremely versatile race car drivers. Uh, even your uncle Paige, although he didn't run much past his early twenties, he ran, you know, road, you know, he did some road racing and obviously everybody knows his midget and sprint cars. And he, uh, he was doing well in stock cars before his unfortunate accident. So you, you've kind of grown up, uh, kind of with, uh, just seems like there's a different mentality that goes along with that. And it is, is it, is it the mentality of, Hey, it's a race car. You know, I just got to figure out how to go fast. Is that, I mean, basically is that. Yeah, that's uh, honestly, that kind of nails it. I've grown up in a family, not of, um, I wouldn't, can, you wouldn't call my, f- if I grew up as, uh, someone else's kid and their family, they're going to be called themselves NASCAR drivers or IndyCar drivers. And I've grown up in a family from my grandpa all the way down of race car drivers. And right. it's kind of sticking. I'm kind of following in the same path. If you think of it, um, that way, and just driving some different cars, which is awesome. And kind of just being a race car driver driving. I like driving any type of race car. Really. Everyone's kind of like, Oh, do you, do you like this better than the NASCAR stuff? I don't, I just like to go out there and try to be the fastest I can make a car go. Um, whether it's NAS, a NASCAR stock car, or now an open wheel USF 2000 car. Um, I like the challenge of driving different things. I love road course racing. I like, I love, o- o- I love oval racing too. So, um, it's cool to kind of just follow, um, in that diversity of, um, kind of driving anything. Yeah. I mean, between your dad and grandfather and Paige, and then spending a lot of time around Robbie Gordon, <laughs> you're going to, there's a lot. I mean, there's nobody's locked into a box in that deal. Everybody's, yep. uh, everybody's a racer. Exactly. And that's just the only yep. thing you can put on it. Mm-hmm. Um, Jagger, as always, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. Congratulations. Uh, it is a full deal for you. I mean, it's the full season and, uh, man, we just cannot wait to see how it turns out for you. And, and, uh, hopefully racer racer can take a little bit of the ride with you and, and uh, we'll talk to you from time to time and, and kind of get some of your race weekend recaps and just, uh, man, just so happy for you. Cause you know, like all racers and I don't care who it is like all young racers, like you, your test was with Jackson Lee as a teammate the other day. And, you know, he's another kid. He's just trying to find his way in the sport. Uh, and, uh, you know, and he had a good test and, and, uh, good for him. And, and, um, hopefully he, He's getting a full deal put together for next year with whoever he's going to run with. And um, it's just, I like seeing young people get their opportunities and, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah. And thanks for having me on here. And hopefully maybe after St. Pete with uh, a trophy sitting over here, we could talk (laughs) again or um, whenever that comes. And I'm excited for the listeners. They get to listen to Mario Andretti after me, maybe a little upgrade. Um, I'll be one of, I'll listen to this podcast too with, uh, Mario. That'll be great to listen to. And yeah, thanks for having me on guys. Absolutely. Anytime. And, uh, you're always welcome. Our guest today needs no introduction. He's the only driver to ever win the Indy 500, the Daytona 500 and the F1 world championship. Who does this guy think he is? Mario Andretti. Mario, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's an absolute honor. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we've yeah. so we've done Thank about you, so we've done probably about thirty of these so far. And unlike our other guests, I mean, most of your career in your life is very well documented. So we're trying to you know ask some different questions. Um, so obviously, when you grew up in Italy, um, one of your idols was Al- Alberto Ascari. Um, and so w- when you were in Italy, was your your goal was at that point was to always race an F one? I'm guessing, right? Well, yeah, I mean. I always say when you're a kid, you're allowed to dream, right? And dream, right. And dream big. And that's really uh, what it was. Uh, at that point, uh, <clears throat> you have no idea, obviously, what reality will be later on in life. But uh, uh, you, uh, you know, sometimes kids want to be firemen. They want to be <laughs> mountain <laughs> climbers. They want to be this and that. I wanted to be a race driver. And, uh, and you know, with my twin brother, Aldo, he motor racing capture our imagination you know just um, that was so prominent in Italy 
in the fifties because you know it was uh, really the, the very beginning of officially Formula One, and and you had the players were uh, uh, Alfa Romeo was Ferrari, Maserati, you know, and uh, Alberto Scotti was uh, a current world champion, you know, in 1953, 54, and uh, uh, I gravitated to that. And Aldo, so did Aldo. And uh, after seeing the Italian Grand Prix in 1954, I always say the mold was cast. You know, I just figured I want to be a race driver. I want to be like a Scotty, you know. So, uh, again, as a kid, uh, that's when it all began. And uh, I never had a plan B since. Uh, <laughs> so that's really the way it comes down to so would you say when you came over to America and you kind of got familiarized with um, American racing, did that change like your racing goals at all? Like, did, did you still have F1 in your hindsight or was it just to be a race car driver? You didn't really care what you were racing. No, I care what I was racing, but uh, I had to start somewhere. You know, right. I had no idea that uh, obviously the start was going to be on the local level on a half mile dirt track and all of that and with a, you know, with a sportsman stock car. But it was racing and it was a beginning. And, um, you know, two years after we uh, landed on these shores, uh, we started building a car, you know, and uh, two more years later, we started driving it. And, uh, and my career basically officially started in 1959 at age 19, which was actually legal. You had to be 21 to race professionally in those days. Um, and, uh, and my last professional race uh, was at the 2024 hours of Le Mans. You know, obviously I came out of uh, the cockpit uh, in IndyCars in 1994, but uh, I did three more Le Mans and all that. Uh, so nevertheless, uh, it's been a great, it was a wonderful ride for me, as you can imagine, uh, having a long career, having dodged so many bullets along the way and, uh, and been able to pretty much accomplish all of my most ambitious uh, goals, quite honestly. Uh, so I say this a million times that I count my blessings every day. Oh, well, for sure. So at what point of your career would you say you really realized like you had a chance of being a successful race car driver? Like when did you know that you, that you were going to make it? Well, I think it's, it's for me, it was when I was in ARDC midgets, Mm -hmm. um, where I was driving up against some of the best uh, uh, midget racers, uh, uh, basically in the history, uh, Len Duncan, Tony Bonadio, some of those guys that uh, uh, really had made their mark. And, and uh, when I felt, and Dutch Schaefer, when I felt that I uh, I could, you know, could be competitive uh, against them and and win. And then started feeling, you know what, I think, uh, you know, I think we're on our way, you know, and uh, it's a good sign. It's just that every time uh, you win, uh, it gives you that extra confidence uh, mm -hmm. for a very good reason, you know, uh, winning is winning. Uh, and, um, you know, coming through the ranks, uh, uh, you know, you feel, okay, I'm in third, fourth, fifth grade, but at least I'm ready to move on. And that's the way I looked at it. You know, I just, uh, everything was a plateau. And once I felt that, um, you know, I, I was able to win on that level, uh, I was ready to move on and hopefully, you know, look for more opportunity. And, and the opportunities did come. Hey, um, was it a Mateka Brothers, was that their midget that you won the three races in one day? Yes, it was a Mateka Brothers midget, uh, which... Uh, I consider that one of the big breaks because up to that point, uh, I had driven uh, three quarter TQ midgets, which I won. Actually, I won their biggest race, which was in Teaneck, Hunter Lapper, you know, and would Len Duncan finish second to me. But, uh, you know, that was uh, something that uh, earned me the ride with the Mateka brothers. Uh, but uh, winning uh, with Mateka brothers in ARDC uh, with that. Uh, with the type of equipment that I was driving against, uh, I felt, uh, yeah, that, that this is really valuable for me. And uh, I, I said this many times, but uh, um, Chris Economaki was uh, the announcer uh, for all uh, three of those races, which uh, one 
and this Labor Day 1963, um, the afternoon was in Flemington, New Jersey. And then the next two features were in uh, Hatfield, Pennsylvania. And uh, when I crossed the line, uh, when I won the third feature, um, I'm just slowing down and I hear, hear the shrilling voice, you know, Chris Economy said, Mario, you just won the ticket to the big time, you know, and that <laughs> resonated, that resonated so much with me. Uh, talk about encouragement, you know, and everything else. Uh, and especially from an authority like Chris Economac at the time, you know. Um, so all of these things, you know, just gives you that boost, what you need, uh, you know, to keep working, working and, and, and then move forward. And it meant so much to them that they made their number three and one. As long <laughs> as I ever saw them race, it was always three and one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so obviously your first year race in Indy was 1965. Was that your first time ever at Indy, like even as a spectator, or did you go before that? No, my first uh, first time at Indy as a spectator was 1958. Oh, okay. Three that right. we arrived in the States. And then um, in 64, I was also a spectator when I was uh, already driving USAC sprint cars. Uh, in fact, in 64, uh, I was offered a ride of one of Mickey Thompson cars and 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 I you know I already had a ride promised by Clint Bronner with the Dean Benline team, but Clint didn't think I was ready for Indy yet, and he was right. And um, and I was floating around, and Bobby Unser uh, nudged Mickey Thompson, says, "Hey, why don't you give this guy a ride?" Uh, so Mickey says, uh, "Well, uh, I'll." Uh, Come in and get fitted up in a car. We'll do the. You can do the test, you know, on uh, tomorrow. And I, I laid awake all night. All night I said, you know what? I have a ride, and I think I have to listen to Clint Bronner. He knows best. I don't think I'm ready. And that was the most difficult decision in my career. Probably the best decision in my career. I never showed up. <laughs> I never showed up. <laughs> I stayed in bed until until midday, you know, that day. And uh, and that was it, you know. So uh, to answer your question, my very first time on the track in a real race car was in 65 uh, when my Bronner Hawk arrived, which was late. It was, uh, I had one day left to be able to do the uh, uh, the driver's test. And, you know, in those days, there were two weeks mm -hmm. of practice before the first weekend of qualifying. And I, I missed out totally on the first week. And then the Tuesday of the second week is when my car arrived. It was late. It was being oh, built in Arizona. And uh, up to that point, I had done some uh, champ car races in a roadster. In fact, uh, you know, before Indy, I did uh, uh, Phoenix, Trenton with the Roadster. In fact, uh, right before any, I finished second to Jim McElreath. But with the Roadster, Jim McElreath had a rear engine car. And then I arrived at, at Indy and, uh, oh my goodness, can you imagine there was a rookie, everybody else is practicing and my car is not there. And finally on a Tuesday I arrived and uh, I completed the test. And uh, I remember that Jim McGee, and I had never sat in the rear engine car. And, uh, but it felt good. It felt right. And, um, and Jim McGee, after I finished the test, was like 5.30 in the afternoon, 30 minutes to go. And he says, you know, let's just relax now. And tomorrow you can just go flat out just the way you want. I said, no, I want to go out tonight. And I went out tonight and I had quickest time of the day. <laughs> So I slept really, really well that evening. I bet. The, uh, you know, you drove, obviously, the, the gamut, really. I mean, like you said, you ran the Roadster and you ran right up until 94, which we were right in, in the middle of the ground effects era and, and the high horsepower in that. And um, what, in, in the particular, I mean, because you've driven almost every type of race car, but uh, kind of what was your favorite type of car? Just whatever was fast 
or did you have one that, of course, you won the Speedway? And, and I mean, that car may be hold something dear to you, but was there a certain type of car that you just loved above all others? Or well, what I loved is uh, open wheel single seaters, you know, because right. that's just the purest form of the sport. You know, it's uh, right. not a derivative of a stock car. Is a great, you know, but but it's a derivative of something, and it's heavy, and it's clumsy, and it's. Uh, and all that, but, uh, you know, and it's not easy to drive, but satisfaction-wise, there's no better to me than a single-seater, you know, where it's like a, the difference between a fighter aircraft and a bomber, you know, and uh, right. so uh, I I love the opportunity to do, to do sports cars, obviously, sports prototype right. are very exciting, uh, did stock cars, uh, did USAC stock cars, I did uh, some NASCAR stock cars, and um, but um, my cup of tea was always a single seater, open wheel single seater. And uh, you know, people ask me, okay, what was your favorite car? Well, uh, my favorite car was any car that I want to race with, you know, quite that's honestly. Right. You know, that's what it comes down to. Uh, yeah. uh, that's what you fall in love with. Uh, and um, but uh, again, my specialty was open wheel single seater, no question about it. Yeah, I, I can, you know, I mean, that's. I mean, you could just tell you just love racing that type of race car. And uh, what what about is it the technical aspect of it? Is it the open cockpit aspect of it? I mean, the fact that it's built specifically just for auto racing, you know, as fast as you can go. Is is there a certain part of it that just speaks to you? Well, yes, indeed. I mean, all of that. It's just that uh, um, the the single seater car is nimble it's uh it's the fastest of all the racing cars you know because of a, the nature of it um and uh it's the uh, quickest reaction uh most acceleration most braking and ultimate satisfaction for driving it's like i mean it's uh it's like a laser you know it's like driving a laser right. you know it's uh um, when you get it right, you know, it gives you that ultimate satisfaction also, you know, from uh, the standpoint of um, having a be able to control something that can really, really hurt you, you know, if you know right. what I mean. Right. No, I, I fully understand that. So me, so me and Scott were talking about something the other day about whether we think there's anyone other than you who's done more laps around IMS. And I, I can't think of anyone. I mean, obviously, 65 to now. I mean, you have any idea how many laps you've done around IMS? That's a good question, actually. And I've thought about it a different time. I, I guarantee you I have over 100,000 uh, between wow. all the testing and all of that. Uh, and that, yeah, I mean, even what I do in, uh, in a two-seater, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, I, I, when I drive uh, during – all the during the practice and everything else and then on a one on a wednesday uh before the, the race we run all day and and i've i've run already is uh, i think uh five or six uh 700 miles you know in one day oh, wow. you know so it's uh i i put miles on there because uh we used to test there all the time and uh like i said it's uh, it's hard to really to, to not to estimate but uh um, I'd be surprised, you know, just, um, uh, yeah. I'd, I'd match my uh, laps with any, anyone actually over there at Indy. Yeah. My I don't see my, my amount of laps run. Yeah. I don't see how there's anybody's run at, at the speedway more than you. And when you take the two seater in and, and all that, I just don't see how. Now through, through the years, like, have you noticed like any, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of changes to the track, but I mean, you know, when you're out there doing the two seater, I mean, does it kind of, I don't know, like bring back memories or like, I mean, does the track kind of feel the same, like throughout all the years? Does it seem different if that makes sense? Well, no, the track is basically, yeah, it's changing, you know, a different, uh, uh, even slightly different configuration when they took away the, uh, the apron and all that. But, uh, um, all in all, however, you know, the general, you know, the layout is the same. It's been in each corner. It's got its own, you know, uh, quirks mm -hmm. about it. Um, you definitely know which corner you're in. I can tell you that. And, uh, the, the, 
even though the, if you look at it, um, it looks like they're all the same, you know, four right. corners, but they're not. And uh, so, and, and then, then it's the wind factor, you know, just how the wind affects you at different days, uh, blowing from different directions, all those things, you know, just come into play. Uh, but um, again, uh, when I'm in, when I'm in that race car, uh, even at uh, the two seater, you know, I'm in my element and uh, I know exactly what's going on. I know exactly, you know, what I need to do, where I need to be, you know, with wind situations and all that. And um, I remember, for instance, uh, um, in 2003, when actually I got upside down testing, you know, for Michael, um, the um, I had been out of uh, a car at that point for nine years, out of an Indy car for nine years. And, uh, and so I, um, um, and the, I think the third or fourth lap, uh, lap, I was flat. So they were with like a 222 or something, you know, and, was a, and at the end of the day, you know, everything by myself, I was quickest. I was like somewhere around, I think 25, 26, 25 and a half, 26 miles and uh, 226 miles an hour, you know, about 226 miles an hour. And, um, and then I was trying to put up a big number by uh, uh, following Kenny Brack right at the very last run of the day. And well, we know the rest of it, you know, Kenny blew the engine going into turn one. Um, I didn't get a warning. And uh, so when I arrived there, obviously I was dodging things and uh, uh, because he hit the wall hard and a chunk of the wall, piece of the wall was laying in the middle of the, the track and uh, I hit that square on and it launched my car up in the air, uh, unseated it, you know, uh, from the ground effects. and. Uh, and I figured, oh, well, I'm going to wind up in a turn two suites there. But um, luckily, the car landed on its wheels and I got away with one there again. So, uh, but the, the bottom line is I just felt in my element right away. You know, it was no, no big deal to get to resume even after that many years in a totally different car. And I was, you know, that place, is, sorry, that place is so funny. Sorry about that, Aaron. That place is so funny. Um, some of the worst crashes or the most spectacular crashes there have happened in testing. Yeah. Um, in practice. And, and, you know, you figure race day or practice days when you got all the cars on the track and they're running so close, but man, they, there's, you know, two or three really bad testing crashes, which I would consider that a pretty bad crash. Yeah. I mean, uh, what are you going to do? I mean, you're flat right. out. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, and, um, and, you know, speed is speed, you know, we right. just uh, leave, there's nothing you leave, that you leave on the table. And, uh, so every time you're in that race car, you're taking the same risk, whether it's a uh, practice qualifying or race day or whatever, you know? So, and sometimes, uh, you know, that's, that's the car that you're dealt, you know? So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, uh, that was a tough one. You know, I felt so bad. There was a brand new car and I yeah. destroyed the car for Michael. <laughs> I, I think the car was the least of his worries at that point. Yeah, ultimately yeah, I was, but uh, I felt so bad. Yeah, well, it wasn't your fault. I mean, just one of those deals. Yeah, we got away with one. I was watching a video about that, and you were saying that your wife actually found out about that, like I think on the news or whatever. I'm sure <laughs> yes. she wasn't happy about that. <laughs> No, well, she knew I was out there, but uh, she was in Florida, actually, at, um, at our condo, and, uh, and she saw it on CNN. <laughs> CNN showed it. <laughs> yeah. CNN showed it in the news. <laughs> That's funny. And then uh, I called her. I said, uh, Deanne, I'm still alive. Don't worry. <laughs> We're still okay. <laughs> So would you say uh, if, if you wouldn't have gotten in that wreck that year, you would have you would have qualified the car and possibly driven in the race if you had the opportunity? Well, uh, Tony Kanan's uh, injury was right. not anything serious. We just, uh, I think it was a cracked bone on his left wrist. And, uh, and there's a chance that he was not able to qualify. There's no question he was able to race. So I was the insurance car there just in case – 
he couldn't qualify, that I could qualify the car, and then he would take on, take on for the race. I was ready for any eventuality, you know, like uh, I was an insurance car right there. But uh, as it turned out, uh, I was not needed. If I was needed, I would have got back in the car, no question about it. Yeah. Because I remember in 2006, I don't know how true this was, there was a news article saying that you wanted to potentially race in the race again. What um, what year do you think would have been the last year, like if you had the opportunity, like you would have driven in the race if, you know, if, if they needed you? Well, you know, again, when I came out of the cockpit, I came out of the cockpit and I had no regrets. Right. Sure. You know, it, it would have to, it had to have been just a really, uh, just a, a very special circumstance, you know, that uh, for me to get back in because, uh, again, uh, I think I thought pretty hard about coming out of the cockpit at that point. Uh, uh, I pushed the envelope, as you can imagine, as far oh, yeah. as I could. And I, my main concern was to still be competitive. I didn't want to uh, overstay. You know, I've seen some of uh, my peers, you know, overstay a little bit and then not have the best memories of their, uh, you know, of, of their uh, uh, last part of their career. And uh, and so that's why I came out. But I, I still felt that I still could be competitive, in, you know, with the right car, you know, uh, uh, for quite some time. So, uh, but I never really needed to do that. And, um, and again, no regrets. The, um, you know, you drove in so many different eras of, of, of the thing. I'm kind of reading notes here cause we're trying to make it, um, a little more condensed for you. You know, you drove in a lot of different eras and times and, uh, what was the hardest thing about I mean, was it easy for you to adjust from the rear engine car, you know, from the roadster to the rear engine car, then the rear engine car to the to the car with the airfoils and a little bit, and, and, and as you went on the ground effects? Well, you know, it, yeah, it, it all takes some adapting, of course, you know, right. and, uh, and, and to me, uh, when you're driven by the desire to do it, to try all these things and try the different disciplines, um, you know, you gotta get it done. You're gonna, because you dive into it. And when you dive into it, you just, you know, you figure it out. Um, the, the one thing that uh, that's common is, uh, is the feel of a race driver. The race driver feels, you, you, you know when the car feels right, no matter what you're driving. Uh, Sometimes, you know, but they all have a different limit, you know, and, uh, and to be able to uh, just be flirting with the limit without, you know, screwing up and going over it is also the trick. But that, these are all the challenges that uh, you're facing. And, um, and that's what gives you the satisfaction, of course. The one thing that uh, I derive a lot of satisfaction is from uh, just going to uh, another discipline and, and be able to not just drive there, but have a chance of winning. And, um, and I've had that because... Uh, I usually I was able to uh, to be part of a good team, a top team. You need the equipment. You can't just you cannot perform miracles, you know. So, um, and that was the objective. Whenever I moved over to another discipline, sports cars or whatever, I always drove. You know, I drove a Ferrari, I drove a Porsche, I drove cars that were capable of winning. Uh, and, uh, and then you go and win, you know. And uh, that's what. Uh, that's what gives you, um, like I said, uh, that satisfaction that you need, you know, to, 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 to be able to, um, you know, to just feel like you want to go on and try some more and more and more. Um, I, again, uh, there was no time that I felt that I had enough, you know, and um, uh, we look at, uh, you know, my, uh, some of my season, the record, the amount of races that I drove all over the place, all over the world. Um, you know, sometimes I wonder myself how the heck I, I got that done, but, uh, uh, but it did, you know, and, and it didn't even feel like work for me. It just, uh, you know, just love to do it. And, uh, um, luckily I had good support, you know, from the fan. My wife was just, uh, uh was so wonderful. You know, she, uh, never, ever 
made me feel uh, guilty, you know, like, okay, what about us? You know, can you spend a little more time with the kids and all that? And, and never, never, you know, I never said that. And uh, I know how selfish I was, you know, to justify myself and my career. But, uh, but I had a profound, profound love. Uh, still do, you know, for driving a race car. And, um, and that's it. Fulfill my life in no way. No, in, in a, there's no other way it could have been fulfilled, uh, you know, other than that, you know. So, uh, again, um, yeah, I, I did I did what I needed to do. And, and um, I came away with um, that satisfaction that's uh, hard to even, you know, quantify is it is it refreshing to see someone like kyle larson who is so you know because it auto racing becomes so specialized for a long time and then comes along kyle larson who's just jumping into everything and he's fast and everything gets into yeah i i've said it many times openly you know how how much i admire what he's doing uh, as a race driver uh he just purely loves driving a race car i mean uh, you watch it everybody's um during the you know the christmas holidays everybody's spending time with the families down in new zealand or somewhere you know uh racing um and um i you know i used to do a lot of the same stuff you know and uh um i mean in my days i raced in six continents you know and uh and sometimes i go from a formula one race to a dirt dirt car race too you know so that's right. probably never going to happen again <laughs> uh, and uh, and so again um uh, uh, th these are these are precious moments you know uh, in my life when i look back as uh, the opportunities that i had and uh, how great that was yeah i was i was lucky as a as a young small child uh, i remember uh, the super team you know the dirt cars and you guys run and it just, I, I have flashes of it. I don't, obviously don't remember full races and that, but man, I always think back on that era. And I also got to see, you know, people like Jan Opperman race, uh, yeah. just, uh, man, it was a special time. And, and that kind of leads me to uh, my next question. Um, so you know, you take Indy cars today that are the term spec. I mean, I guess that's the term you got to use because there's one, Tub manufacturer, and you you got that. But you are allowed to do. You know, your engineers are allowed to do some things. Being someone like yourself, and again, I, I this may not even matter to you as a driver. Would you have preferred to run in an era like today, where the mechanical failures seem to be less, um, or did you like driving in the wide open era, where it's just the you know whatever the mechanics and engineers kind of come up with. Well, let's put it this way. Um, I look back at, uh, you know, all the races that I was leading, I had in my pocket, back pocket that uh, I couldn't finish, um, <laughs> including Indy. Uh, and um, I always, I said this many times, I said, I think I was born too early. You know, I feel <laughs> that uh, because, uh, you know, in those days, it was uh, important to be a little bit patient and so forth. I, 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 I had a go, you know, if you look at, qualifying my qualifying record was pretty darn good and uh yeah. you know i just i wanted to go right from the get-go and and all like that and so my style would have been perfect today you know and, yeah. uh, and so yeah th that's the beauty of it you know and today these guys uh you know like you know dixon and so forth winning all these races uh i wish i could have finished at least half of the ones that uh, were i had in my pocket I guarantee right. you, my record would have been a heck of a lot better than it is today. So, um, you know, there's there's always something out there that's that, that that's different. But uh, uh, then at the same time, I look back at uh, would I give up going through all of those decades of development and understanding, you know, the, the dynamics, uh, suspension dynamics, aerodynamics, and everything else. How everything works and the benefits that we got along the way and how we did things before the computer and all that. And, and so to have maybe even more appreciation for what's out there today um, 
And uh, so again, uh, you know, you look back, you can't have it all, obviously, you know, but uh, <laughs> uh, going back to answer your, your basic question as far as the reliability factor and stuff, man, there's nothing wrong with having a reliable race car. I tell you, you, you today, you know, you just you push, you know, to the limit of what you got. And, uh, and you, you know, and usually you're going to finish the race because they don't take, by rule, they don't take a hundred percent out of the engines. You know, the engines have to be mileaged out for, you know, for so many miles and, and all that. So uh, your chances of finishing the race, unless there's a mistake somewhere, you know, are phenomenal, you know, and, um, and that's what was lacking in uh, during my career for sure. Yeah, Aaron and I were talking about this beforehand, and, and I told him, I really feel like uh, you really are, you really were the prototypical modern race car driver, uh, just from the way you drove uh, to how hard you run all the time. Uh, I just feel like when I look back in your career, like you said, you were born a little too early, and I think that's really I think that's really uh, a a great assessment because today, I mean, especially coming up through the midgets and sprint cars and that, and kind of the way you drove is now how they drive today. And, you know, in Indy cars, you know, you ran a hundred percent every time you got in the car and that's how you have to do it today. And I, I, yeah, I think that's a, a, a great way of putting it. Um, I'm going to give you kind of a list of names of drivers. And just kind of speak to their kind of what it was like to race against them, you know, like, you know, because you got to have an encyclopedia on everybody you race against, right, to know their styles and that. So uh, it's a short list. It's not a it's not a super long one. Um, my guy, Parnelli Jones. I oh, Parnelli was just uh, the only thing that I I did not race a, a lot against him because he retired uh, pretty much when I came on on the scene in uh, 1965. Uh, later on, uh, I drove against them in stock cars and so forth. And we had some fun doing that, you know, at, uh, always good friends with, uh, with Parnelli. I admired him so much, you know, as, uh, as a driver. He's another guy that uh, was so versatile. You know, you could put him in a dirt car, you could put him in a sports car, you can put him in a stock car and he could win anywhere, you know? So, uh, yeah, uh, highly regarded by me, trust me. Uh, and I'm just happy that at least I did some racing against him. Now, have you ever, uh, got on him about unleashing Bobby under on the world by hooking him up with, with uh, Grant Telly? <laughs> have you ever, have you ever gotten on him about that? Well, yeah, you know, we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, James Hunt. It was James was another one that was he was uh, he was uh, in his day any time any given day he was as tough as they come. Um, he and I had a couple of run-ins, you know. Uh, one time I think going for the lead in uh, in, in Sanford, uh in Holland, and um, there was a, they called the Tarzan Curve. First turn it was some banking, and um, he's leading, and I'm going on the outside, and he just just drove me right off the track. And, you know, we both got together and we just, you know, out, out of the race. And and he says, you can't pass in Formula One on the outside. I said, well, I said, you pass wherever you can, you know. But the, the reason I'm saying is the following year, he, he was already out of the cockpit and he was an announcer. And I, I pulled the same move on Carlos Reutemann and it worked out. And he said, oh, Oh, I, I I stand corrected. He says, I guess it is. It can be done. <laughs> but you know, he and I, you know, we had some good racing. Uh, you know, many different uh, tracks. So you know, where we uh, we were like first, second, or third, second or third or whatever on podium together. Yeah, he, he was uh, James was a was an interesting guy to uh, to race <laughs> against. Or a good one for sure. Dan Gurney. Dan Gurney was uh, here, another another driver. And I always, I've said this, you know, he falls in the category of uh, Sterling Moss, you know, uh, uh, a world champion that never got the crown. 
you know, I think Dan Gurney had the quality of, uh, of a world champion. And I think probably just uh, by sticking with his own cars, which were very unreliable, uh, he probably gave that up. If he would have stayed with uh, one of the more established teams, uh, he probably would have been world champion. Um, uh, here's another guy that could win in sports cars, you know, which he's done in stock cars and, and Formula One. Didn't run any dirt, though, you know. No. Those, <laughs> you know but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, he was one of the good ones for sure, you know, yeah. Yeah, he uh, he definitely loved that. Uh, you know, I didn't know it, but it just seemed like he loved the technical side of it as much as the driving side of it. You know, he did, he did, he did. Yeah. Uh, we we can't have any list without the Texan Super Tex. Yeah. Okay. No. AJ. Yeah, AJ. Again, uh, when I came on the scene, he was you know established already, uh, current champion. Uh, and um, and uh, as good as it come, I mean, he was the standard. Uh, he was, you know, five years uh, senior to me, so I had quite a few more miles under his belt. And uh, but I was kind of nudging at his side. I was kind of uh, uh, annoying him quite a <laughs> bit. And uh, and and he's the one, another one that I think made me a better driver because. Uh, uh, I knew that, um, you know, at the time he was the best and uh, to be able to go against him, I better work pretty hard. And, uh, and I mean, it takes somebody like that usually to just make you a better driver because uh, you just don't rest on, 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 on what you know and your law. You just got to uh, gotta go for it. And, um, you know, uh, always said, you know, to win over AJ was, you know, one of the, the, the ultimate result, you know, at the time. And, but also to finish second to him was not a bad day at all either. So, uh, again, yeah, I cherished those times uh, and I, would, I wouldn't change that for anything. Yeah, and you guys were so funny because uh, you both had that drive and passion, but you were such different personalities, uh, yeah. you know. And he um, – now you know again. I'm 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 a little too young to remember Foyt in, in his heyday. Um, the one thing I always take away from listening to stories about AJ was how his his calmness in the car and his uh, smoothness. Would would that be accurate? Very very accurate indeed, and uh, that's the thing that I've admired about him uh, along the way because uh, we know uh, how volatile he could be. You know, out of the cockpit. You right. know. And, but in, when he was in a cockpit, you could always trust him. He would never do anything stupid per se, or you know, or yeah. try to hurt you or, or any. That's why he's still here today, too. He was smart. AJ was always very smart with his driving, and, uh, and that's the beauty of it, too. You know, that's how you uh, you learn to uh, to respect and, and admire somebody like him. And I have for sure for all those reasons. Yeah, I, I always felt like he, this from what I've heard, is he never put you in a position where you had to save both your lives. You got you it. Know. For sure. Um, man, a, a, a guy who, super smooth, Big Al. Big Al, yeah, 100%. Uh, I mean, uh, he, he was really the right driver for the time. You know, he had great race craft and, uh, he was fast when he needed to be fast, but he was also very calculated, very, very patient. And um, I admired him for that. I often wish I, I was uh, as patient as he was at times, you know. But, uh, yeah, there was always something to learn from him as well. Yeah, that photo of you guys run the Champ Dirt Cars where he's got it nice and side, man, and you're just backed in and you got the right rear right in there. <laughs> that, that that photo couldn't could not – you know, the essence of the personalities anymore, I don't, I don't believe. Um, Mark Donahue. Mark Donahue was uh, another one of those driver, driver engineer. You know, he, um, he would uh, be very analytic about things. And uh, I don't know anyone that understood the dynamics of a car uh, more than he did. And, uh, and I think sometimes I could make up for, 
what was lacking maybe in his aggressiveness by having the car really super, super well uh, set up and all that. So, yeah, he had those qualities in spades for sure. And uh, Jim Clark. Well, I didn't get to drive so much, uh, you know, just the uh, you know, fact that, that the first race there at, at Indy, my, my rookie race. And uh, um, all I know is, you know, obviously what he had done, uh, me as watching him as a spectator, you know, I didn't have uh, any opportunity to really um, do wheel to wheel with him or anything else. It was a little bit too early in my career, but uh yeah, you know, Jim, as you can see, he's revered as uh, one of the best ever, you know, so. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure if you got a chance to run too much with him or not. And a guy that was off my list originally, but I think he's probably one of the more underrated drivers uh, with the most talent, um, and that's Gary Benhausen. Yeah, you know, uh, no question Gary uh, had, like you said, I think he was unlucky. Uh, a few times, like with his injuries and everything else, which uh, no question affected his career, you know, and that's the problem sometimes that, um, you know, in those days, uh, there were so many uh, great drivers that uh, didn't get their opportunity because of uh, that being so unlucky. And he was certainly yeah. one, but uh, talent plus, no question that uh, the whole Bettenhausen family, you know, was blessed with a lot of that, uh, starting with Tony. Yeah, and um, hard luck in the family, but man, Gary was so good. I, I felt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's my list. Thank you so much for answering those questions on that. My pleasure. Uh, we always try to anytime anytime we've got a driver of your caliber, we try to ask him questions like that because you you've raced against so many of the legends. So thank you. Uh, when you were racing, in, in, you had. Really, the rare, I mean, there's very few people, at least in IndyCar, who kind of come up and you ran against your brother, you ran against your nephew, you ran against your sons, both sons, um, and then you've got to see your your uh, grandson race. And it, it as a driver, how, is that hard? Or were you able to compartmentalize that okay? Um I would almost think it'd be harder to watch Marco race because you're out of the car, you know, than it would be I the other. <laughs> you... All over, you know, I never, uh, never felt uh, as uh, apprehensive, you know, as, as once you're on the sideline and watching them race, because that's when you've, Oh, I can't help it. You know, I, I'm really a nervous Nelly on the sideline, quite honestly. Um, and uh, that's when I started realizing how maybe my wife felt all, all along all these days. You know, I kept right. saying, don't worry, I'm fine, this and that. But you know what I mean? It's just uh, it's a natural thing, you know, to just uh, be ex have a lot of anxiety. Um, but um, at the same time, I, I felt that it was so wonderful, so unbelievably fulfilling you know, to be racing against your own and on the same track uh, with the same objectives. I mean, you just look back. I mean, I have so many stories of, you know, us as a family together. I mean, uh, you know, we've been to Le Mans, you know, we're just uh, Michael, John and myself. Uh, we've been at Daytona, Michael, Jeff and myself. We've been, you know, and uh, we've been on podium, the, you know, the all Andretti podium in Milwaukee, you know, with the Michael, John and myself. And, you know, and Michael and I were on podium in an IndyCar race 15 times. Right. And wow. then, and 10 times we started uh, first in, uh, on the front row and five times, you know, we're first and second, you know, so, um, in 1986 at Pocono, the 500, Jeff was driving the Indy Lights, which was ARS at the time, and he was on pole for that. It was a, the uh, supporting event. He won that. Michael was on pole for the 500, and I won the 500. The three of us cleaned house. So as a family, when you look back, you know, and those uh, figure, how in the world can you ever top that? You know, so... Uh, uh, the sport gave us so much, you know, over over the years, and uh, and so yeah, that's where you got to look 
you can look at those positives, you know. Um, uh, obviously, uh, my brother paid dearly, you know, with the uh, injuries. Um, I was a lucky one. Uh, Jeff paid dearly with his injury in his legs, and Michael was the lucky one between the two. And uh, so we know that uh, nothing is a given, you know, if there was a price to pay somewhere. But that overall, however, you know, we were all blessed. And, uh, and again, uh, as a family, uh, Aldo had, including himself, four drivers on his side and me, four drivers on my side. So between the two of us, we made a mess of it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what's, uh, what's Jared? Is what's Jared run? What did he run this year? Because I knew he's he was doing sports cars. IMSA, yeah, IMSA. Sports, yeah, yeah. LMP2. Yeah, he was doing some races with Marco, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah, one or two races, but um, yeah, he's uh, basically uh, he's got uh, one more that uh, you know the, 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 in in Atlanta, you know, in a mm -hmm. ten hour. Race. Yeah, I watched him run the sprint car quite a bit, um, but I, I have never watched him run sports cars. Yeah, he's very good. Yeah, no, he is. He was so, a good sprint car driver, too. I mean, he he, he was fast. Like he just they had yeah. my bad luck. I mean, he was always getting caught up in something and just yeah, I know, crazy. But he's quick, yeah, yeah, he's fast. So obviously, you never got to race against Marco. But one thing that I thought was cool back in 2016, you did um, straight line testing at Cape Kennedy with him, right? And the yes. Indy car, and you, I think you got up to like 250. Yeah, we close to 250 miles an hour. Yeah, we were just messing around there, just the high speed just to get a feel. Just messing but, around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was fun. It's fun. How, how does how, uh, that... I'm so I'm sorry. How Andretti was it, uh, in the 2006 500 that Michael's leading? Marco has to pass Michael to try to win the race. I mean, that, I mean, just, you know, that was a, a pretty thrilling moment too. And unfortunately we all know how it ended, but uh, man, that, you know, Marco had to chase down his dad to try to, and his dad's trying to win his first 500 on top of it. Why Marco's trying to win his first 500. Well, you know, when you're out there, you know, that's it. You know, it's no, you're on your own. I mean, uh, you just uh, you look after yourself. Yeah, and, uh, that's right. Remember, uh, you know, uh, even when uh, when I won over Michael, for instance, uh, it was the closest finish ever at, at, uh, in Portland, you know, and uh, I won because Michael was uh, running, you know, I had a fuel pickup problem. And my wife says, how could you do that? You know, it's just done. It's <laughs> all very easy. You know, you just go for it. You know, so... It was the same thing with, uh, you know, uh, Marco felt like he could get by his dad, and he did, you know. And this, uh, right. unfortunately, I think, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, that he didn't have the push to pass, you know, that, uh, uh, anyway. Right. No, yeah, I understand. Right. Yeah. And, and Aaron, I'm so sorry. I, I know I stepped on your question. My apologies, bud. No problem. I forget what I was going to say, so you're good. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> um, you know, you're obviously um, world-known. I mean, you, you're very rare uh, as far as you can kind of go almost anywhere in the world and people know the name Mario Andretti. And, um, and, and you're Arguably, I mean, you have to be maybe Lewis Hamilton today, but for as long as I've known, you're probably the most famous race car driver in history. Um, has that ever, I mean, has that ever been a problem in, in public or, or has that been something that you're just easily be able to go through life with? Um, because, I mean, that's a big, you know, not everybody's known <laughs> like you are. Well, I don't, I don't know anything else, you know, but, uh, right. I mean, uh, uh, certainly not a problem, you know, uh, people always, uh, you know, kind and, and respectful and that's all, you know, you could ever expect and, uh, or want. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, just, just fortunate in, you know, that I've been around, uh, as long as I have and, uh, 
you know, um, how can I say, you know, did I deserve it? I probably not, but uh, somehow I dodged the bullets, you know, and uh, and here I am, still enjoying my life and still, you know, doing some driving, even though like a two-seater, but still, you know, I'm still enjoying uh, doing what I'm doing. And you still fly yeah. the um, and I and I apologize, I don't know the name, but the the hang glider Ultralight. thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I see the videos yeah, yeah. on like Marcos I, and Hens Close story every so often. I haven't given up anything. I'm still doing everything <laughs> that I did. I still, you know, I uh, slalom skis. I do everything that I always did. Uh, I haven't given up anything yet. Well, I'll definitely let you be the pilot of that. That's, <laughs> I'll watch your videos. I'm not going to do that. So <laughs> we've we've talking to we've talking to a couple of pilots and one was Paul Goldsmith. Um he actually taught Bobby Unser how to fly, which we were joking with him about. Yeah. I love Paul. <laughs> Paul is an amazing, amazing man. And uh he still, still works. Still, still works still, every day. Yeah. He's uh you he talk about an inspiration. Um I always had so much regard for this man as the driver uh and as a pilot. All of it, you know, it just, um, uh, again, you look back at, at his age, nothing phases him. You know, it just keeps right on going. The last question I had, um, so if you if you were to go back in time and you were to see the 18-year-old Mario Andretti um, and you would tell him everything that he would accomplish, what do you think um, the 18-year-old Mario would say? Do you think he would believe it or I think he'd be? You know what? Um, uh, I've had, actually, uh, I had the letter to myself. I did, uh, I had that part of it done where mm -hmm. basically, uh, even looking back, I said, just stay the course. I mean, stay the course from the standpoint of, uh, just keep pursuing, uh, what you know that you want, uh, regardless what the bumps on the road, regardless what the potential obstacles, you know, just stay the course. Um, and um, don't deviate. As I said, I never had a plan B, and I'm glad I didn't because, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I stayed on plan A, and plan A worked out. You have to have that resolve to be able to get things done. Was there ever a time you questioned it? Ever, once? Not ever. Man, that's, Not that's such a great life. Not ever. Man, that's so great. Um, Actually, what yeah. one one last thing I just thought of, and I know people have asked you this a lot, but have you ever like been pulled over? Been you? You already know what question I'm going to ask you. <laughs> and someone said, "Who do you think you are, Mario Andretti?" Not know that it was you. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually, it was with Vince Granatelli. We were on the coast in the Santa Monica, and uh, he was giving me a ride in one of those uh, Camaros that they. That, turbocharge and everything else with 60,000 horsepower. And uh, so he blew a light at, at, in, at an intersection. He got pulled over. And that was uh, the same weekend as the uh, Long Beach Grand Prix, the Formula One. And uh, and uh, of course, I was in that race. And uh, anyway, but I was a passenger. And, uh, and the officer said, who the hell do you think you are, Mario Andretti? And so Vince started laughing and the <laughs> officer, get out of the car right now, you know. So he says, it's not a laughing matter. And the guy's, well, are you sitting over there? <laughs> you know, so, That's so funny. So the, the officer, yeah, he looked down and said, so I, I think I saved old Vince a little bit of fun. <laughs> You, you know, you talked about Vince, and uh, I was able to meet Andy once. I, I just in a high by thing, and uh, what kind of guy was Andy? I mean, I mean, he seemed so gregarious. He had such a big personality, but at the core of it, it seemed like he really cared about his friends. And Andy was a good man for sure. Like you said, gregarious. I mean, uh, uh, flashing personality, all of it. You know. Uh, 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 a master, you know, in business, uh, promotions and all of that. Uh, but uh, deep down, a great human being, you know, that was very warm. Uh, you know, we were great friends and so forth. And uh, and so, again, I have nothing but good things to say about Andy Grantelli. Yeah, he, 
like I said, I, I was lucky. Actually, I, I think I made him twice. I think I made him once in his suite and then once over at Iron Skillet <laughs> going to dinner one night. But uh, He loved that place, yeah. Oh, he loved that place, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because all um, you could eat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, so, again, Mario, you know, I, I would love to pick your brain about everything you've ever done in auto racing, but that'll never happen. But I just want to say thank you for what you've done. Um, you've, you are, you made this crazy, I shouldn't say crazy, this incredible uh, switch from your driving career. And then you kind of kept racing, but then you became the ambassador for IndyCar as well. I mean, you've, I mean, you are like, the guy, you know, you're out here and you, you're so kind to come do this with us. And, um, man, it's just, uh, you've had this remarkable career and this remarkable life. And thank you for sharing it with us. Well, it's my pleasure. You know, that I love the sport so much. Yeah. Hey, speaking of these people, we kind of hit them earlier and, um, uh, Robin Miller, obviously we discussed with him earlier and I'm actually wearing, in honor of Robin and you, I'm wearing the Mount Rushmore shirt. It's the first time I've worn it, and it'll be the last time I wear it. I, it's going in a frame. But uh, what I mean, as you got to know Robin over the years, he, I'm sure he went from kind of this an, annoying guy, you know, at first, you know, he's a reporter and all that. I mean, and then there, it just seems like every he grew into this great love because I think just from taking away from watching the Memorial the other day and that you guys understood how much he loved the sport and he loved it as much as you guys. Would that be correct? Correct. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And uh, like I said, it takes time, you know, to really totally understand the motivations and why you do this, why you do that. And, uh, but uh, we grew together, you know, basically, of course, yeah. you know, I was, uh, you know, uh, quite a bit older than him, but at the same time, I remember him just uh, out of, basically out of high school, you know, when he got a job as a reporter and trying to become relevant, um, very aggressive. And then uh, sooner or later, said, well, you know what? He's doing this. He's doing a, well, a, a really good job. He's really trying to get as much, you know, information. To, he's trying to, uh, to get as many tips as he can at a time. And, he, you know, he's, and he's doing all the right things. And then deep down, though, he could always tell he loved, loved, loved the sport. To him, again, there was not there was not a, a plan B in his career either, you know. So it's not that he moved on onto another sport or you know uh, he did his stint, you know, and in in IndyCar or in racing. No, he's, that was it. That was his life, and um, not too many can say that. When he bought that midget racing midget, did that? Did that resonate as a guy who raced like, hey, this guy is really trying to find out what it's like to be someone like myself? I mean, that may seem superficial on, on the surface, but I, I think that would go a long way. I always say if you if you are willing to put the money on the table, then you, you've got my respect, you know. Well, he did. He got a, all of our respect for sure. I mean, uh, he just obviously he wanted to see what it's about. You know, whether he could right. do it, whether he could, uh, and then I think he came away even with uh, more of an appreciation of what, uh, what it takes to do it and do it right. Um, and like I said, you know, he even tried, you know, a couple of times to kill himself on it, you know, but uh, um, all of it, you know, always played, you know, in his career, but you can tell he was all in. He was all yeah. in. Yeah, and I think that's a great way to leave it. And from another guy who has been all in for his entire career. Thank you so much, Mario. Yeah, thank you, Mario. My really pleasure, guys. Really appreciate it. Okay, Aaron. <laughs> all the best. <laughs>